for once I can say I beat Max Tech to this kind of video. Although keep an eye out for theirs because I know it's going to be super detailed and great too. Mad respect for them. But anyway, yeah, I've had the brand new M1 equipped iPad Pro 2021 models for about a week now. And I figured you might be seeing a couple reviews, unboxings and the like today. And while these videos are fun and I definitely have mine planned and still in the works, today I thought I'd kick things off with a chonker of a video project. I'm not even kidding. I've been putting this together for the past week and I'm still staying up all night trying to publish mine on time. It's like 2 a.m. right now. But anyway, in this video, we're going to be reviewing and comparing the 2021 iPad Pros to their beloved 2020 and 2018 brethren in order to help you decide whether it's the right time to upgrade, buy used, or stay put. The industrial look of the iPad Pro has remained largely unchanged since its debut in 2018, and nearly three years later, it makes a lot of sense. Within a given device category, Apple is known to carry over the same design language for at least three generations of product. And I'm not really mad either. This thing still looks fresh and feels amazing, with its refined straight lines, angularity, premium aluminum finishes, and uniform bezels. Speaker quality has also always been a major feature with iPad Pro. I didn't notice much of a difference between the 2018 and 2020 models last year, and the same goes for this year as well. Pardon my lack of proper audio terminology, but the lows, mids, highs, and overall audio clarity sound about the same across the board. However, I do find that the new 2021 iPad Pros do get a bit louder, particularly the 12.9 inch. I actually used an app which measures decibel output to determine this. This increased volume might be the product of a hardware tweak by Apple, or really just a lack of consistent usage, unlike my last gen models which I've owned and used for quite a while. Not to get ahead of myself here, but what really blows my mind is the fact that this clipboard-like form factor can now house roughly the same components as my specced out 13-inch M1 MacBook Pro, the machine that pushes all of my intense 4K content creation and more with relative ease. In short, I really believe the team responsible for the modern iPad Pro design intended to make it last a few years and accommodate increasingly powerful and advanced tech. Despite this, the chassis has had to subtly change over the years to do exactly that. In March 2020, the camera module got bigger, which required a much larger aluminum extrusion compared to the previous third-gen tablets. On a similar note, too, this year Apple decided to implement a Pro Display XDR-like panel into the larger 12.9-inch iPad Pro. While the 11-inch model has maintained an identical figure since 2018, of course with the exception of the camera module, its newer, bigger brother had to get a bit thicker and heavier to accommodate its more advanced Liquid Retina XDR display. Compared to the 3rd and 4th Gen 12.9-inch models, which came in at 5.9mm thick and 1.41 pounds, the 5th Gen 12.9-inch has grown to 6.4mm thick and a flat 1.5 pounds. It definitely feels a tiny bit chunkier and looks a hair thicker, but if you're already accustomed to the 12.9-inch form factor, it isn't anything you can't get used to in a matter of a day, and ironically enough, I am actually really happy this ended up happening. I say this because for years, I think so many of us prayed that Apple would one day become a little less hell-bent at delivering thinner and lighter devices and instead exchange some literal air for functionality. They did this with the 16-inch MacBook Pro back in 2019 to implement better thermals and a wildly better Magic Keyboard, and nobody complained. I think they got the message because now in the iPad Pro's case, we're getting a better, brighter display, which is actually our next topic of discussion. To preface though, I wanna address something I think might be a common misconception with this new 12.9 inch Liquid Retina XDR panel. I kinda of feel like an idiot for not reading the tech specs page closely enough before getting my hands on this device, but I for one was under the impression that this panel would look brighter in all conditions. This is not the case. For regular SDR content, which includes the general iPad OS UI, max brightness is still 600 nits, a shared limitation with every other 2018 plus iPad Pro model on the market, more importantly, the new 2021 11 inch, which still packs the regular liquid retina display. I mean, don't get me wrong, for everyday tasks, 600 nits is still plenty bright, and if you're sporting an older model, the good news is you're not missing out on a dramatically brighter general iPad OS experience. But I'm not gonna lie, I would have loved to have seen an iPhone level bright display on iPad Pro, and you'd figure that increasing the chassis thickness would allow them to pack in a bigger battery and in turn push the brightness limit, but who knows, maybe the size of the display limits how bright it can actually get. For example, the $5,000 plus Pro Display XDR itself only outputs SDR content at 500 nits, so I guess we can't complain too much. But let me stop myself. As disappointed as I am that we don't get 800 plus nits of brightness during general usage, when it comes to content consumption and creation, specifically HDR content, it's a subtle to night and day difference. At the very least, you're going to be enjoying the new 1 million to 1 contrast ratio, thanks to the 10,000 mini LEDs present in this display. 
Going off Apple's April event, these give the Liquid Retina XDR panel 2,596 individual dimming zones, which create an OLED-like effect or really high contrast. In layman's terms, the blacks are much deeper or truly black. You can notice this by just looking at the black bars you get with YouTube videos, for example. On the older or non-XDR models, you can barely see the backlight shining through, and with the new display, it's very minimal, if not impossible, to notice. All in all, you just see more nuance in images and videos because once again, these individual dimming zones increase the dynamic range or contrast of this display dramatically, hence the XDR badge. And speaking of XDR, when you do end up consuming HDR content, this display is absolutely glorious. When consuming HDR on full screen, this display can output up to an impressive 1000 nits consistently, and the highlights go up to 1600 nits, which is 1000 over the STR limit, which is crazy. When viewing some outside footage, for example, the display, for lack of a better way of saying this, almost mimics sun and sunlight in general. You obviously can't experience this while watching this review, but if you have a more recent high-end smartphone with an HDR-enabled display, go watch some HDR content on YouTube. If you happen to own a Note 20 Plus, for example, you might be able to get a pretty accurate picture, at least on the small scale, of what this experience is kind of like because it too has a max peak brightness around 1600 nits when viewing this kind of content. All in all though, if you watch movies or make movies, this feature is going to be amazing for you. Nonetheless, Liquid Retina XDR or not, these displays have been and continue to be gorgeous with industry standard P3 color in all 2018 and newer iPad Pro models. They are also so satisfyingly quick with the 120Hz refresh rate or ProMotion we all know and love. As I've said in the past, it makes everyday UI navigation or manipulation absolutely buttery and is one of the main reasons I bought my first iPad Pro, a 2018 11-inch unit, nearly two years ago. It just makes tasks like sketching, drawing, scrolling, and more feel incredibly lifelike and once again, super satisfying. Like speaker quality, at least on paper, screen on time has been another constant figure. Apple claims all models can achieve up to 10 hours of general usage, more specifically web surfing on Wi-Fi, and nine hours on cellular with auto brightness on. I'd say that's a fairly honest estimate because battery life really depends on what you're doing. Generally speaking, I found that the 11-inch models tend to fare a little better or last a little longer, and that makes sense because the 12.9-inch has more physical display and resolution to drive. This year though, at least in my preliminary private performance testing, from what I can tell, M1 appears to be more power efficient. I'm actually currently planning an in-depth performance test between the 2020 and 2021 models, and a few days ago, I started doing some test runs to prepare myself to record that and also write the script of this video that you're watching here. Also, before I say anything else, keep in mind as well, the 2020 and 2018 models perform almost identically in most cases, with the exception of some GPU heavy tasks. I even proved this last year in a previous performance test that I posted. Anyway, within the first few minutes of opening apps, some general usage and some benchmarks, I noticed a three to 4% gap in favor of my M1 model. I figured it might be due to some battery degradation, you know, like normal wear and tear on my last gen device, but as the testing wore on, after importing and editing some footage in LumaFusion, the gap increased to 8 to 12%. About an hour into the tests I was running, I saw a 15% gap once again in favor of the M1 iPad. And when I wrap things up with 15 minutes of 1080p video, mind you, the whole time I've had auto brightness off and screen brightness maxed out, I noticed a 16 to 17% gap between the two. And this actually makes a lot of sense. For the nerds in the audience, iPad Pro has been running on nearly three-year-old Apple Silicon A12 series seven nanometer architecture. With M1, the transistors have been shrunk down to five nanometers, increasing efficiency and power as more individual transistors can be fit onto a single processor die or chip. Like I said, I've yet to share an entire video dedicated to testing performance and screen on time somewhat live, but again, from my preliminary, fairly thorough and documented testing, it's safe to say M1 can afford you some more quality time with your iPad Pro, which is great for those of us working on the go. Last year, iPad Pro received a major camera update, which brought an ultra-wide sensor and lens as well as a LiDAR sensor to enhance AR-oriented tasks. This was an upgrade from the 2018 model's single 12 megapixel sensor and lens. And even with this new module, however, the F1.8 main wide camera specifications and features remain largely the same. The only difference I see is in image processing. While noise and color look the same across the board, I definitely think Apple applies a little more sharpening and definition to photos than some video clips with the newer 2021 models. The two previous generations have a more untouched look, which I honestly prefer. But if you know me, I'm not one to shoot a bunch of content using my iPad Pro anyway. And for once, the main difference between the new and old models is on the front of the device. The front camera has finally received an update for the first time in years. It's now 12 megapixels, a bit more closed up at f2.4 from 2.2, but much, much wider, offering a 122 degree field of view to be exact. 
This allows you to take GoPro style selfies in front video, which is actually pretty useful, especially if you need to film and monitor yourself in a tighter space. This wide field of view also brings a brand new video call feature to the iPad Pro. If you watch the keynote, you may already know Apple calls it center stage, which adjusts the position of the crop of the wide camera based on the position of your face. Essentially, it makes it seem like someone is following you around with the camera, which makes FaceTime, Zoom, and the like a lot more engaging. I've had a lot of fun playing around with this feature by myself, and I cannot wait to make even better use of it with friends, classmates, and family in the future. But beyond design, the displays, battery life, and the camera modules, the most important aspect of any iPad Pro has to be performance. And before the launch of the M1 Max, specifically the MacBook Air and Pro, the A12X and A12Z equipped iPads were often matching, if not blowing their Intel laptop cousins out of the water with regard to benchmarks, everyday, and heavy tasks. And as if the last gen processors weren't good enough, Apple decided to implement the now critically acclaimed M1 chip into their new 2021 models. I will say though, with Macs, it's been a little easier to see how Apple Silicon has greatly impacted the way applications run, native or translated via Rosetta. Intel Macs sort of set a performance baseline, and as many of us know, M1 Macs have rivaled, if not exceeded many previous Gen X86 Mac desktops and laptops. But with the new iPad Pro, specifically iPad OS, things are a bit different. This is a major theme I plan on touching on in my full review coming later this week, but as of right now, it seems like we're driving a Prius with a 6.2 liter Hemi. And if you don't get my drift, uh -huh, there's so much more power available with this new model, but at the current moment, and of course this is bound to change very soon, there's not enough of an outlet or enough optimization to take full advantage of it yet. And even though this is the current situation, hopefully remedied by the next version of iPadOS and upcoming optimization from developers, I have noticed a general uptick in performance across iPadOS and many of the apps that we make use of. Once again, although I will be posting a dedicated performance test on this channel within the next few days for your reference, the first thing I'll say is apps do tend to open or load a tad to a lot of it quicker compared to the 2018 and 2020 models, depending on how light or data rich they are. More specifically, I found large games and editing applications like LumaFusion are ready to use or play at a few moments notice, which is really, really nice. When it comes to keeping apps running in the background, for most users, I think six to eight gigs of RAM in the 2020 models and the baseline 2021 models should do the trick just fine. I actually have two of the baseline or cheaper iPad Pro models coming later, the new ones, so stay tuned for my coverage on them as well. Hell, even the four gigs of RAM in the 2018 units with the exception of the six gig one terabyte model does nearly as good a job thanks to Apple's amazing hardware and software optimization and integration. What's crazy is the top spec versions which I've been testing sport 16 gigs of RAM, which seems absolutely ludicrous on paper. But if you've kept up with my channel, you might remember that I had swapped out an eight gigabyte M1 MacBook Pro for a 16 gig variant simply because Final Cut Pro and other creative applications need more system memory to properly run or at least more smoothly operate. I figure Apple thought the iPad Pro might need this additional RAM for similar heavier tasks, which we'll touch on a bit later in this video. As for the overall OS experience, specifically the animations, I think they feel a tiny bit quicker, maybe? The issue is I don't think Apple had much to improve upon. If anything, the M1 delivers the same, if not a better super slick buttery iPad OS experience and will bring an unprecedented amount of performance to heavier pro tasks when software once again is better optimized. This is guaranteed beyond a shadow of a doubt, by the way, because we know just how capable Macs are with this chip. I mean, just look at the benchmarks. I'm pretty sure in an iPad chassis, M1 is run at a lower frequency due to some power and thermal limitations, but single core Geekbench scores, which dictate how everyday tasks run, are very, very close, 1710-ish and 1740-ish respectively. For reference, the 2018 and 2020 models muster a single core score or single core scores around 1120-ish, which as I've said earlier, pushes iPad OS and basic tasks so, so well already. As for multi-core scores, which indicate how heavier tasks are handled, iPad Pro 2021 is only 450 points off of the MacBook Pro, which has a fan inside, mind you, and is even closer to the fanless MacBook Air. Again, for your reference, the 2018 and 2020 iPad Pros achieved a multi-core score of around 4,700-ish, which is still more than capable of editing 4K video and pushing graphically intense games, all while being a staggering 2,550-ish points behind the new M1 models. In short, as I've continued to say, the best is yet to come for these iPads with proper optimization. The benchmarks are a testament to this, as well as some non-optimized tests I've run privately thus far. For example, I found that with LumaFusion, an app that I'm sure is very soon to be optimized for M1, the new models constantly outpace my 2020 model by a few seconds, again, unoptimized, I might add. 
Importing footage also seemed quicker thanks to the implementation of Thunderbolt. I copied 7.25 gigs of A7S3 XAVCHS 4K video in about 88 seconds compared to 100 seconds with the previous gen models. If your formats are a lot more obnoxious than mine, this is definitely going to be a benefit, and I doubt I've even scratched the surface of what this extra port bandwidth can do. Nonetheless, scrolling, scrubbing, and general experience on the timeline within LumaFusion definitely feels more responsive thanks to the massive boost in raw CPU power, the extra RAM, and the M1's GPU that is almost twice as powerful as the variant in A12X and Z. I'll throw some benchmarks up for your reference as well. This also encompasses iPad Pro gaming. Although I'm not much of a mobile gamer myself and wouldn't immediately notice an increase in FPS, I mean, after all, the previous gen iPad Pros are more than capable of handling the best of what the App Store has to offer as of right now. On top of loading more quickly, games on these M1 equipped iPad Pros run like a dream. The extra RAM cannot hurt either, but yeah, Apple claims these devices can deliver console level performance, and although I don't have any way to quantify this very well at the moment, all I'm gonna say is I believe them. Coincidentally, as I was finishing up the script for this video today, I checked some iPad news headlines and saw that a whole PC and console RPG, Divinity Original Sin 2, has been ported over to iPad. This is no simple 3D title either. It's crazy detailed with virtual environments that have to be rendered and simultaneously lit while you make your way through the game. The most insane part to me is that you can play co-op with two controllers. From what I can tell, this is two instances of this already intense game running side by side. I think this is a prime example of an M1 optimized app, as the app description lists a limited number of supported devices, with the M1 iPad Pros being listed at the very top. To sum things up, iPad Pro with M1 has powerful potential for casual and professional users alike, and like I said, this is the theme of my upcoming proper review that I'll likely be posting this weekend. Before we wrap things up here though, I wanna quickly talk about the accessory situation between these three iPad Pro generations. First and foremost, the Apple Pencil second gen works with all three, so if you're upgrading from a 2018 model, your stylus will still work. I, for one, am still using the one I bought all the way back in 2019 with zero issues whatsoever. Secondly, although Apple does not officially endorse this, the old Magic Keyboard for iPad Pro 12.9 inch is compatible with the brand new, slightly bigger or thicker variant. It's not an absolutely perfect fit, but it's close enough so that you'd never notice, so no need to buy a new one. As for the white Magic Keyboard, the brand new variant, I personally think it looks super clean. And speaking of clean, like something literally being clean or free from dirt, stains, etc., this thing has held up just fine so far. It's designed to be wiped off, and if I'm being honest, the black model is not free and clear from getting dirty either. White or not, though, it's the same keyboard with a fantastic trackpad built in. I'll probably touch on this more in my soon-to-be live proper review I keep alluding to. I also have two final thoughts here. As you may know, these iPads are 5G capable, which is great if you can take advantage of it. I live near a downtown area which has some 5G hardware and it was crazy seeing the gigabit download speeds. Other than that though, if I'm on cellular, I'm accessing LTE, which is more than fine for the time being. And secondly, I wanna give a great big shout out to the amazing people over at Paperlike. Um, I have a Paperlike screen protector on this 2020 iPad Pro here that I've been using as a teleprompter. Maybe you noticed that, but I had to because I wrote six pages of a script, guys. I cannot possibly try to, you know, remember things like sort of on at whim or on the go. I'd be sitting here for four hours. So I did this today. This was quite the experience, a little easier, but still a bit challenging. But yeah, Paperlike makes these amazing uh, screen protectors that make writing feel like you're writing on paper, hence the name. I've been using this for over a year and I'm gonna install one on my brand new a 2021 iPad Pro when I start using it more regularly when I get out of this you know review phase but yeah these are great I highly recommend you get one I'll leave a link in the video description down below and that about wraps things up guys uh, this is the biggest video I've ever made for this channel and I'm so fortunate to be able to do this even though I'm burning the midnight oil here and I'll probably get like two hours of sleep but it's all worth it for you it's been so much fun testing these and I have so much more iPad Pro content coming soon also some M1 Mac content and if you're new here please subscribe you know stay tuned stick around I, like I said I have a lot more great content coming your way and uh, yeah now I gotta edit this A roll and hopefully get this out by uh, you know the morning uh, so I'm gonna leave things to that. I uh, hope you enjoyed. Subscribe, like, comment, whatever you want. And um, as always, I'm Noah, and I will catch you all in the next one.